and well, it sucks. That's it. Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, my name is Sarah and I make videos about health and fitness and all of those things, endurance sports. So if that's something that you're into, and let's face it, why wouldn't you be? You should hit all the buttons down below. All the cool kids are doing it. Peer pressure for the win. You know, when your parents used to ask you if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it too? You lied. You would have jumped off that bridge. Don't jump off a bridge. It's a bad idea. I'm totally getting canceled. But today's video is the second installment and well, me bitching about Zwift. If you haven't caught the first video, I'm gonna link it up here. I recommend watching at least the beginning of that first to give a little context as to what I'm doing here. And it's not just me whinging about Zwift to be a jerk. But I wanted to start this video by revisiting the equipment conversation very briefly because I think it was misconstrued by a number of people. I had some people, not the majority, but some people get a little miffed with me in the comments saying that, well, it's not really fair to leave out people with lower budgets and that it was a little bit elitist or exclusionary to be that way. And that was not the spirit with which that was intended. I think most people really construed that. The reality is, is what I was talking about is in effect being fair to those people with the lower budgets because getting into Zwift is not a low barrier to end in terms of cost. You have to buy trainers, you have to buy dongles, you have to buy accessories, things like that to get into the program. It's not gonna be less than $500, even if you're using entry level equipment. And I understand to save money using the laptop that you already have, well, that's free. But when Zwift tells you that you can get into it for that lower entry, and then you have a shitty experience, well, that's sunk cost. And then you have to start spending more money that you hadn't originally budgeted for because it just does not work effectively. That's why I talked about things like using an Apple TV or a box. What I didn't really talk about was using a cell phone or a tablet, right? Things that you already have. If you have a flagship device from the last two years, which many people do, there's a reason why the MSRP on those is higher than most entry level laptops. They are more capable. So you could use something like those and you can use screen mirroring for a smart TV or you can use a pretty cheap dongle to connect you to the HDMI, right? Those are options that are probably going to be superior. It's not the best experience, but it's superior than using a lower end laptop or computer that does not have the dedicated graphics and isn't capable of running the program. Now, don't get me wrong. I think the right thing to do is to support legacy devices, but as things are, where Zwift is going to use their own proprietary game engine that is not really right-sized for lower-end equipment, it's really not going to be in the cards. You know, there's been a lot of talk from people who criticize Zwift, like, why don't you use somebody else's game engine? Most games do that. You could be a little bit more flexible with different equipment. They don't want to. That's their own business decision, and that's fine. You can't put lipstick on a pig. You have to call it what it is. Be honest with people. You know, I, I came up with that idea of using a box, but if you don't have a box, you know, use a, a phone or tablet that you have lying around with, you know, a $20 cord to hook you up to your own TV or monitor. It's going to give you a better experience, and it's not going to cause all the churn that we see in the game. And that's going to come into effect in the very first thing I want to talk about today. This is kind of the elephant in the room. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this, but Zwift really needs to do something about the bugs. Every time that there is an update release in Zwift, it is an absolute disaster. And considering that they only come up with these updates, maybe quarterly, maybe twice a quarter if we're lucky, it's always always a disaster. You know, there, there's an expectation that there's going to be maybe a couple of little bugs. That's fine. You know, the whole spinning shadow that they had a couple months back, yeah, you could deal with that. That's not a big deal. It's kind of funny. It doesn't really affect your gameplay. You're just like, what is going on there? But this last update that they rolled out where they did the new pack dynamics and they released a couple of new frames, I mean, that almost broke the game. How does that get out to your customers? You are almost seven years into this platform. How are you still releasing updates? Updates that nobody asked for, mind you. Don't get me wrong, we'd like to see improved pack dynamics, but it's kind of on the lower echelons of you know the hierarchy of things that we are asking for. I mean, people's rides weren't being saved. That's a big deal. Data integrity is a big deal, especially when you're training with purpose. I always run a redundant backup on something like my head unit or if I use Trainer Road, but not everybody thinks to do that. They are assuming that Zwift will do the bare minimum effectively and it will save their ride and post it to Training Peaks, to Strava, to wherever. And when you lose that data, that really damages trust in the eyes of your customers, especially those people who are, you know, in their first trial period, people who are newer to the platform. I mean, I was hearing stories of people that I was riding in group workouts with this week, how disastrous it was last week, people riding everywhere. That's just unacceptable. And I don't have a development fix 
for those things, right? The purpose of some of these complaints, if you will, is not to just throw stones, but to posit potential solutions. I don't have a solution for that because it's not my workflow, it's not my program, but what I will say is, apparently you need to do a better job testing because that should have never gotten out to your customer. Now that got out, not only did you have to do a bug fix, but you had to roll back pretty much the entire element of that update. And this is not the first time. I, I don't know what the fix is, like I said, but do better seems like the appropriate response. Like that's really bad. That's really frustrating. This isn't just, you know, most of the rest of the things I'm complaining about are, you know, nice to have or annoyances, but it really doesn't affect my impetus to ride in the game this is a problem. And this is where competition can swoop in and take the win because there's only so much more of this that your customers are going to accept, especially when you're talking about onboarding more and more developers. There should be more error proofing. So um, that's all I wanna say about that, but you need to take care of the bugs, Swift. Now, the second thing I wanna talk about is racing. And this is a big one, and I'm gonna talk about some potential solutions. So this is gonna be a few minutes of me, you know, chatting my head off here. And I know a lot of you don't race, but understanding the implication of racing on Zwift as a whole, given that, you know, developmental resources are downstream from racing. A lot of those feature sets are read across features. Racing impacts all of us, whether or not you race. So you do have some skin in the game here, even if you don't tow the line for a race. Now, as I see it, there are three different types of users or subscribers on Zwift when it comes to racing. The first are those people who really love racing. That is the big draw for Zwift for them, having a number of people to race with pretty much any time. They might not use structured training, they just race several times a week for their high intensity. It's an important part of the platform and it is a deal breaker if racing is not available to them. The second group of people are more in between, right? They'll jump in a race from time to time, they'll do it to test their fitness, or if there's kind of academy events or other Zwift series events, they wanna get the credit, they wanna unlock the jersey, they just wanna do it for fun. And they'll jump it from time to time, but they can maybe take it or leave it if it wasn't a big part of the platform. And I consider myself to be in that camp. That's just my own particular training. If Zwift didn't have racing, I'd still use Zwift. It wouldn't be a deal breaker, but I do think it's a net benefit for the entire platform. And the third group of people are, well, people who just don't race. Now, I think those two groups at the end, there is a subcategory of those folks. There's people who really don't race or race much because they're just, they don't care and they're not interested and that's fine. And then there's a group of those people who might not be towing the line for races because it's either overwhelming or they know it doesn't work and there's some real frustration there. And both of those things really come downstream from the categorization system. It's really the root of all evil when it comes to racing. You know, first and foremost, I am not sold on using watts per kilogram as a categorization metric, at least not by itself. I understand it's probably one of the best things that we have considering it's a virtual platform, but it creates a number of issues, right? New people get a little bit overwhelmed with watts per kilogram because Zwift has democratized the metric of power. And that's great. Having more people getting into train with power is a great thing, but they haven't really figured out how to bridge the gap of knowledge between the two because training with power is not as straightforward as just looking at this you know, one dimensional number. People have to have an understanding of how that fits into their biology and physiology. And most people really do not. And that's not a shot against people using the platform. It's, it's you're missing that piece, right? So when you're telling people to categorize themselves based on watts per kilogram, when they don't even understand the demands of racing, the physiology, things like repeatability, what FTP really means, how the heck do they categorize themselves? They're just kind of guessing and jumping into races. You know, maybe common sense would say if you're just starting out, you jump in with the Ds, but perhaps you are just genetically better than that even as a beginner. It's different for all people and it, it gets overwhelming. And then when people jump into these races that they think are appropriate based on watts per kilogram, and then right off the gun, people just go absolutely apeshit bonkers and, and right away, it can be overwhelming and, and new people to the platform might be saying, man, I don't want to race. I'm not good enough to race because they just don't understand what's going on. Another element to using watts per kilogram is the ability to manipulate that. Right? We have things like Zwift Power out there for sure. It's helpful. I don't think that using a third party, which is now owned by Zwift website, is an appropriate response. A third of the people who are on Zwift race with any degree of regularity. About half of those people are on Zwift power. But at any rate, you can manipulate your positioning in your different category based on understanding how those category limits work. So I'll give you a practical example. In the open category, so men and women mixed, I would be a B category rider based on my raw wattage and my watts per kilogram. I could absolutely ride with the D riders, win that race, 
and never break category limits or ever look weird in terms of the results, right? Even if somebody doesn't go to Zwift power, just looking at the results, they can look at my average power in watts per kilogram and I will not have broken the limits that are specified in the original categorization because I could just ride that entire race with a lower RPE or a lower percentage of my threshold and be comfortable and then just kind of uncork it in the last couple of minutes and ride away beyond the cat capability of the people in the field when that race and my average power would look just fine, right? So using that as a standalone metric within the race itself, I don't think it's effective. And Zwift is kind of chasing this idea where they're gonna disqualify people mid-ride. And what happens when you break category limits in the ride, they're just going to ghost you and make sure that you can't impact the ride. I think that that's a little bit short-sighted because it is punitive to those people who might be having a breakthrough day, right? As you get better as a rider, you start to go from category to category. Maybe you start as a D and you start to get to the point where mm, I'm tickling on that C, I'm not quite there yet. And then you have that breakthrough workout and then what, you're gonna be disqualified. There's a lot of issues with using that one single standalone metric to have people categorize themselves. The other element is self-categorization. If you're going to take racing seriously, having people self-select their category by race is just, it's not acceptable. It doesn't work. That's not how it works on the real road. And yes, Zwift is a game, but having people self-categorize is really the fly in the ointment when it comes to people racing on a fair and level playing field. You know, an A rider can just come in and beat up on the C's anytime they want and use the example I just used, right? They can still stay within category limits, but they're only riding at their endurance pace while people are busting their ass and turning themselves inside out to compete. And then they just kind of happily ride away and win. And a lot of people will say, hey, that's a hollow win. Why would they do that? Absolutely, I agree, but people still do. That's human nature. The W is a W for a lot of people. They don't care if they're sandbagging or not. Those two elements really feed into an unsatisfactory framework for categorizing yourself in racing. Now, how do I think we should solve this? And what's interesting is that my thought process behind this has changed over the last couple years. And most of that is endemic to the fact that the demographic on Zwift has changed. You know, two years ago, if you had asked me, I would have said, make it results-based. Make it just like you are on the road. Everybody starts as a D and you race and you ride and you have a points-based system. You know, Zwift Power has some of the math built in for that. And then Zwift could use that to upgrade people or suggest a category over time. But the reality is, is I think that there's a use case for, we'll call it sandbagging and bear with me on this. You know, we have a more pedestrian and recreational riding base on Zwift than we did two years ago. And that's a good thing, getting more people on bikes that could potentially transition to maybe more performance-based riding, that's all a net benefit. We want more people on bikes and we do not want to exclude those folks. And I think that there's an element where, let's say I'm, I'm an A rider and I wanna get out and do something that's going to simulate that Tuesday night group ride where things are a little bit punchy, maybe we're kind of sprinting for a couple of stop signs, or I'm just trying to hang with the group and hang with some moves. Well, I wanna simulate that, but I don't wanna bust my face open in an A race. And I don't feel like riding solo and just kind of trailing off the back. So I kind of want that balance. So a good option for me would be to go into a B race and just kind of hang with the group and not really make or generate any moves, just kind of try to hang with the pack and go with the surges and not impact the race. And that will give me the workout that I'm looking for. And there are some people who will look at this in the binary to say, you know, no, you impact the race, get out of there, you don't belong there but then you have to offer me an alternative. And that would be by the way of a group ride. But if you take a look at the group rides, it's not really operating or offering up that type of framework. Most group riders, let's face it, stick with the beacon, hold 2.5 watts per kilogram. There's value to those social group rides for sure. A race is going to be what gives you that more representative group ride to those typical kind of a competitive group rides that you see out in the real world. So I'm not being offered that. So catting down, so to speak, in a kind of a community-based event, if I'm not gonna go sprint for the finish and be an asshole, I think that that's a good value there. Because Zwift at the end of the day is a game and a tool. I need to get out of Zwift what I need for my training. And if that means I'm gonna jump in with the C's and just kind of ride, I'm not gonna go sprint for the finish, I should be able to do that without feeling like I'm a piece of shit about it. But how do you balance the desires of people who are serious about racing and people who wanna use Zwift as a tool. And I think that there is a middle ground. And I think that's by creating two different subcategories of racing. And those would be chosen by the race organizers. And the first category I would recommend is either recreational or community-based racing. And that's pretty much what Zwift has right now. 
right? You've got you know a number of different categories. I'll give you some category recommendations or limits. People can jump in there for whatever they need it for, whether it's a you know competitive group ride, whether it's a practice race to see kind of how racing plays out, to practice their pack dynamics. All of those things will be available on the community-based racing. And yes, there's still going to be some sandbagging, but you have to realize at that point that, well, if you want to take racing seriously, there's another subcategory for you. So you're going to have a little bit of kind of weirdness and people in the wrong categories, but they'll find their way. But if you want to take racing seriously, there will be another category and we can call that performance-based or elite or whatever kind of terminology you want to use. And this is where you put your controls into place. And what I would recommend is maybe a two-part system of categorization. One comes from your power curve and not from within the race, but your previous power curve, your lifetime power curve, if you will. Maybe they'll kind of wait that for the last 30, 60, or 90 days. But it doesn't include just races, it includes your entire performance on Zwift. So they know that you're not manipulating the system. It's gonna be very hard to manipulate your power numbers just to get on Zwift and race. Yes, you could do your training outdoors and come inside and kind of fake it, but it takes a lot of extra work to manipulate that. So they can use that power curve and kind of determine where you are against you know, the greater population of Zwift and kind of provide a starting point as to what category you may potentially be in. Then the other half of that would be results-based. If you get to a point where maybe your power curve doesn't put you in the Bs, but you're just winning against the Cs, then you upgrade. That's what happens when you're on the real world. You don't just get to beat up on you know, cat fours in perpetuity. At a certain point, you earn enough points and they say, nope, you've got to jump into the cat threes now. Same thing's gonna happen on Zwift. And then what happens is if you are winning, or if you do break category limits and you have a breakthrough day, you're not getting disqualified or punished because you're right on that bubble and you're trying to improve. That means it's a trigger for you to upgrade and then you go into the next category, right? Using those two in conjunction. And if I'm not mistaken, I think WTRL is looking at something like that. I think that that's a great idea to use. And then the lockout would be, you cannot pick a category lower than what Zwift is categorizing you at. So if you are a B, Category C and category D are completely blacked out to you. You cannot get in there. Let people cat up. If you wanna to try to race with a higher quality or caliber of group, absolutely let people push themselves to a higher level because there's no safety implication. If you get dropped or run through off the back, it's not like you're gonna cause a crash, right? So if you're a B rider, you can ride with the A's. That's perfectly fine, but you cannot cat down. Now you have to account for a certain amount of decay that might happen if somebody is sick or injured or off the bike for a period of time. And my recommendation for something like that is instead of trying to do that in the algorithm, just have a cat down option. So it, maybe it's a 24 hour waiting period. And what happens is you select a button on you know, the performance side of racing that says, you know, request to categorize down. And what it will do is it'll do a quick check over your last 30 days of power curve or 60 days of power curve data. And it will do a sense check and say, yeah, there's really no ride data populating here. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and grant this. But then if you start to overperform again, then it's going to immediately upgrade you again. So you're not gonna be able to really manipulate that all that much. It doesn't have to have an individual or personalized review. It can be completely systematic, but give it a waiting period of about 24 hours to negate any people trying to capitalize on that and then maybe give it a limit of once in 90 days. You can only request a categorization decrease once every 90 days. And then people will use that, you know, intelligently. They'll use it when they need it. You know, they get hurt, they get injured. It seems like something that would be easy mathematically to figure out. Yes, it's going to be a pretty substantive change to the programming to get those mathematics in place. It's probably going to take at least six to 12 months to have that fully implemented if it's not already in process. But I don't think the current FutureWorks or Zwift HQ protocols that they're trying to use for anti-sandbagging, I don't think that's the right direction. Use some of that math, some of that work that Zwift Power has already done to help to kind of generate points and figure out different categorization and different power profiles. Use that and bake it right into the program. I'd also like them to use some of the enhancements. So for things like serious racing, you're gonna need to have a heart rate monitor. If you don't have a heart rate monitor paired, you can't even get into the race. It's not disqualifying you after the fact. You cannot enter the race if there's no heart rate monitor paired. If you don't have a smart trainer and one of the smart trainers that we understand to be accurate, 
you don't get to enter the race. That doesn't mean there's no racing for you. You have the recreational racing on the other side. But I'm saying that performance-based racing is going to be people who are going to reach to a higher standard. So your KISS races, your WTRL races, uh, some of your herd races, right? And the organizer will pick that by race. Maybe they do want some community events, great. And then some of their events are gonna be more on that serious performance side of the business. And it's not going to glut up the calendar and nor is it going to reduce the number of races on the calendar. It's just going to be a little bit more exacting and you have to be a little bit more choosy, right? If you want to be in a performance-based race, maybe they only go off once every two hours. Okay, well, that's what happens when you go race in the real road. You have to plan. You know a week in advance, at least a day in advance, what you're going to choose. You know, you get yourself all prepared up. Yeah, you're not going to be able to necessarily jump on Zwift at 514 in the afternoon and immediately jump into a performance-based race. You could do that for a community race. But the point is that there's going to be plenty of options on the calendar with all the different race organizers and they can kind of choose. There's value in creating community-based races because those people might transition over to those performance-based races. And it creates a framework around which you can start to build sanctioned races, things that have maybe a payout attached to them, professional grade races. You know, instead of having to take people offline and do all that stuff or count on Zwift power to do that, you can have a lot of that baked into the platform. You can certainly add in those enhancements like verified weight, verified height, using a website to do something like that, you know, secondary power sources, corroborating data for a lot of these pro series races. All of that is certainly valuable, but I think you can bake a lot of that right into the game and you can create a lot of lockouts and then people will understand the higher degree of integrity and efficacy in the results. So that's my solution, I guess, for racing. I know it's not perfect. It's not extremely specific. Obviously, I'm not going to write the algorithm for them, but I think this is a good idea. And I'd love to hear what people think out there who race, what they think about having this kind of two option idea. The last thing I wanna talk about is the user interface. And well, it sucks. That's it. Okay, well, it sucks is not particularly constructive. And you know, I don't have anything specific in terms of how they should design the user interface. You know, it's 2021. There's a lot of best practices out there with menu systems and user interfaces that they could certainly borrow from to integrate in the game, but it's clunky. It's old. There's a ton of complaints about it. They had some big wins recently, a couple months ago. They finally let you exit out of a ride without exiting the game. For those of you who haven't been around, what used to happen is if you were in a ride, if you wanted to exit out, you exited out of the whole program and then you had to restart it. And if you didn't have a solid state drive, that could take a few minutes to get back into the game. And people would do this all the time when you pair up and you hit that okay in the bottom middle of the screen and it would hang for a minute and then somebody would hit okay again because they thought it didn't register you know, the, the mouse click or whatever. And then that would just jump you into the game. You're like, shit, this is not the course I wanted to be on, right? So that was a real pain in the ass. They fixed that, that was a big deal. Uh, they came up with this new removal of the heads up display. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with this. I think they should have given you a, a small minimalist option to at least view your power and your speed and your heart rate and things like that. You know, if you wanna put it in the upper right hand corner or the bottom in the middle because I typically don't wanna ride blind. But really when it comes down to it, the complaints about the user interface are a lot more substantive. One of the big things that I'd like to see addressed is how they use roots, right? Again, another big win recently was for root badges because the root badges are really popular. You used to have to go in to the game, look into your badge collection and see which ones were left. They finally added it to the root selection screen with the green check mark. So now you can see which ones you've already done. That was a big win. But what about looking at your progress bar? It has been years. Why, ha why is there no progress bar? It's not like they don't have it built into the program because you can see it in event mode. But people now have to remember what the root was and then there's lead-ins and you don't always know if there's a lead-in. You have to go on Swift Insider and look for these types of things. Why can't you just put it right on the top of the screen so people know how long the in is, how far they are, especially for the longer routes, how much do I have left to go? Just put that into free ride mode. Maybe you program it so it only does it the first time, right? So if you don't have a green check mark on one of those badges or you don't have the badge for it, then it shows you the bar. And if you do, it won't show you the bar. Whatever they want to do with that, but you already have the bar programmed into the actual platform. Let's get it available for what people really want to use it for. I don't know why they're not doing that, but you know, that's, that's a big hitter for me because a lot of people are really into that root badge hunting. And I think another element of root selection at least comes down to the fact that there's enough subscribers and users on Zwift at this point that you don't need to limit the root selection. So if you haven't been around that long, what it used to be is Watopia and one guest world. So the guest world would rotate via the calendar. You could only pick Watopia, that other world. Then they extended it, maybe I think it was a year ago, to two guest worlds and you know Watopia being a constant. 
content and it gave you a little bit more option because things were getting a little bit overpopulated, right? More and more people on Zwift. Now you could certainly hack into different worlds, but you're riding by yourself. I think at this point from my observation that a lot of the routes are getting to the point where they're so crowded at any point during the peak hours of the day for you know the American time zones, the European time zones, I think it's time that you just open up all of the worlds. Let us select any world we want and any course we want at any given time. And it will probably give you some good data to understand where to apply your resources as well. If people have to compare all of those worlds at the same time, you can start to look at density and look at where you want to expend your resources. We're probably going to still see what we've always seen is Watopia being the most popular. What's the second most popular? Is it still London? Is it McCurry? I don't know, but you might be able to tell when people are comparing them all at the same time and making those decisions. Now you know where to expand your worlds and expand your courses based on popularity and what people are really looking for. Just giving you an indication as a company where to look and where to apply your resources to world development, it might help you in that regard, but every time I'm on Zwift, it's just like people everywhere. Maybe if you let more worlds be selected at a time, it would kind of disseminate some of that a little bit, but that's just my opinion. The menu systems, they're just clunky, all right? Just trying to get through different menu systems, multiple button clicks. If you're not on PC and you're trying to do that with touch screen or what have you, Apple TV, that's a problem. You have to make them a little bit more easy. One of the things I really like to see is having a bike swap option. So maybe before you get in a race or a group ride or even a free ride, you can set up and stage up a bike swap. Maybe you want a mountain bike waiting in the wings. Kind of set that up in advance without having to go into pairing mode and stop the bike and be at a standstill. You just stage that up and maybe there's a button that you can hit that does a bike swap. So when you hit a certain part, maybe you hit the jungle and then you hit your button for bike swap, it still stops your avatar and it takes that minute or two to change your bike over, but now you're not trying to shuffle through the menus. It would just be kind of a cool option where you can just program that into the game, right? Maybe you can even program a little car jumping up and a mechanic dropping a bike in front of you. I mean, that's a little bit extensive, but being able to swap your bike, still put the requisite stop time in there. What is it, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, whatever you wanna use but let people stage that up in advance, set that up in the menus without, you can't get into the garage, you can't get into the wheels, you can't even browse those things unless your avatar is stopped. So that would be a nice thing for people to add on. Hotkeys were a definite help for things like PC and Mac. Those are not available for users of things like Apple TV or tablets and phones. Maybe you add some pop-up touchscreen buttons or something that you can hit with the remote for quick access instead of having to go several menus deep for those types of things. But the menu system is just inadequate. It's time for a refresh. Again, maybe some of this goes back to the game engine, but let's do some work on the menu system. Another thing that I'd like to see them look at is how they give you a heads up display on segments, right? That is a huge thing for people, whether it's out on the real road or in Zwift. Sometimes you wanna go for that KOM or QOM and there's tons of them out there. But for some reason, Zwift only shows you your status against the KOM or QOM at the end of the segment right? Unless it's a shorter segment. It takes you until halfway between the last switchback and the final banner on Alp to Zwift to kind of figure out where you're going to land. It's difficult for some of those longer segments to figure out if you're on track ahead or behind. You know, Garmin, Wahoo, Hammerhead, Carew, they all have those kind of segment trackers and, and partners that you can look at and say, mm, I'm on track to beat the KOM, QOM. Oh, I'm a, a few seconds behind. Whatever it might be, it allows you to pace things better to see if you're on track. I'd like to see them have that as an option. Even if they don't keep it up all the time, maybe you can toggle it on and off in the menu. But I would like to see from beginning to end where my progression is, right? What's my estimated time to complete this particular segment? Let me look at the KOM or QOM. Okay, my time to complete is at you know two minutes and 13 seconds and the QOM is at two minutes and five seconds. I gotta bring up the pace. But if I don't see that until the last 30 seconds of the segment, well, that I miss my chance. I, I can sprint and I might still be off the pace a little bit. So that'd be a nice thing to see considering how popular those segments might be. And if you wanna have that you know jersey on the day, give people the tools that they could use to get there because it's very difficult to try to do that math in your head in real time. I think there's a number of things that they can fix about the user interface to just make it a little bit more smooth, a little bit more modern looking, right? I, I could go on all day about that, but those are some big hitter kind of maybe features in terms of their user interface that I would like to see that would actually enhance not just the looks, but the gameplay. Right? Having those things available to you to enhance on your experience in game. Those would be great things for them to attack. Maybe some of these are already in the works. I don't know, but 
that's just kind of my two cents on user interface. But I'm gonna cover those three. That's gonna be it for the day. I spent a lot of time on racing especially, so I know this video is gonna be a little bit on the long side. But let me know what you think about these three things. What do you think about racing? What do you think about the user interface? And uh, you could tell me what you think about the bugs, but I'm pretty sure I know what to expect there. But I appreciate you guys sticking around to the end of the video. If you did get some value out of this one, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button, and if you haven't hit that subscribe button, you know, really does help the channel out a lot. I appreciate you. But as always, I will catch you guys in the next one. See ya.